Science is not, deliver certitude, as you well know, science is not in the belief business, it's in the doubt business. So when people are astounded that a newspaper story three months later says, sorry, it actually isn't a depression gene, sorry, we're wrong on that one. Then they start thinking, well, so what good is science anyway? They keep on changing the stories. What can I trust? What can I believe in? Right? Now, what's that about? Because plainly the media has put out a story. Are they, were they too fast to put out a story because it was newsworthy? Should they have waited a little? It's about scientifically illiterate journalists. Is it the scientists who it's need about, to get the grants and therefore need the story Well, two out? things. When you learn science in school, because you, you, you brought two separable variables together, and I want to keep them apart. One of them is, do people understand that science is more a process than a list of answers? Mm. That's a separate issue from whether the public requires an answer to something. Um, sorry, whether the public comes to doubt the value of science because a result changes from one week to the next. And with regard to science being a process, that's just a missing part of the science curriculum in K through 12. That's got to get in there somehow. We get textbooks and there's a problem at the end of the chapter and there's an answer to it and you got to get the answer and, there's, and you start to value the answer rather than the process that would lead to that answer or another. So, so uncertainty as well as ambiguity are not elements of a science curriculum, but they clearly need to be. Otherwise you're incapable of thinking in meaningful ways about the frontier of science. And it wouldn't be hard to teach this. For example, you could say, what's the shape of the Earth? You say, well, it's, it's a sphere. You say, well, no, it's not quite a sphere. It's, kind of, it's a little wider at the equator than at the poles. Okay, so it's a little squashed sphere. There's a word for that, two words, oblate spheroid. And then you say, well, okay, it's not quite that, actually, because it's slightly wider below the equator than at the equator. So in fact, the Earth is kind of pear-shaped. So that's the shape of the Earth. But how pear-shaped is it? If you held Earth out here and looked at it, if, if, you, if you used Earth as a model for a cue ball in a pool table, it would be the smoothest cue ball anyone ever made. So these variations from equator to pole and from below the equator to the equator are actually so small that it would make no difference to you if I handed you that sphere with that shape you would not be able to feel it and tell the difference. So that's kind of interesting. So there's no right or wrong answer here. It's a conversation about what the shape of the earth is. Not enough of that goes on in the science classroom. And because we're, we are seduced by the right answer rather than by the journey to the answer. Now, getting back to, to science fluctuating on the frontier, journalists got to learn that you can't, you can't hang out at the editorial offices of the journals and take every single research paper that shows up and declare that to be the next truth. That's not, that's not the next truth. The next truth is if that article gets corroborated by other research groups, if a consensus emerges, then you can talk about a new emerged truth. Until that happens, there is no truth. It is the bleeding frontier moving frontier of science. And journalists need to convey that. If they don't, that they're failing at the job. Let me take up your first point there, which was the one about how, in, how you can invoke a situation in which people become conspirators in the act of discovery. Okay, so... I like that. Consp see, I just invented it's the that. British thing. <laughs> conspirators in the act of discovery. I was at a That's shortened five paragraphs that I just gave into one <laughs> phrase. I'll take 